And indeed, there was a study done um, a few years ago where they looked at people in their 50s and they measured lots of things. Uh, and then they followed them 10 years later to see who was still alive. And the best, the single best predictor of whether you would be healthy and still alive uh, was your ability to balance on one leg when measured 10 years previously in your 50s. I mean, what Mark said to me and what I've subsequently learned is the sooner you get on with it, the better. Pre-diabetic is even better than type 2 diabetic. Uh, but there have been numerous trials since, uh, mainly led by Professor Roy Taylor up in Newcastle, who is one of my health gurus, who has shown in trial after trial, big randomized controlled trials, that if you do a rapid weight loss diet, that's 800 to 900 calories a day, relatively low carb, uh, then uh, within, um, you know, certainly within three months, the majority of people are able to come off medication. And he said you basically need to lose about 10 kilos. He said to actually reverse type 2 diabetes, all you need to do is lose one gram of fat from your pancreas, because what's happening is the fat is clogging up your pancreas and your liver. But to do that, you're going to have to lose about 10% of your body weight. And that's what I did. And when he told me that, and that was soon after I published The Fast Diet, because mm. I met up with him, uh, he was regarded as pretty much loony, you know. Well, this was the point I'm really interested in. You described the approach of, of intermittent fasting prior to this as something you saw uh, thought of as complete nonsense. How much of that was driven by your medically trained background? Oh, a huge amount, because, um, you know, the things I was taught were very conventional at medical school. We were taught almost nothing about nutrition, to be fair. But what we did learn is essentially that you have to go on a balanced diet, you have to um, eat slow and steady, lots of different meals, you know, all the stuff which we now know is not true. And we're also told that type 2 diabetes is an inevitably progressive disease. There is no cure. There is no way to reverse it. You cannot put it into remission. The only thing you can do is take the drugs and hope. So all of this turned out not to be true. And um, in the 10 years since I made that program and wrote that book, it's become increasingly obvious it is not true. But uh, one of the things the dean of the medical school told us on the first day is that uh, we'd learn a huge amount over the next five, six years. But within about five, six years, most of it would be out of date or wrong. So he said, keep, keep learning. And that is one thing I've attempted to do. You know, challenge your assumptions. How much has that driven your decision all the way along? I think of your career initially starting as, uh, your medical career starting as a doctor, but you decided to put that training to a different use. How much was that led by uh, hearing things that you soon learned perhaps weren't necessarily true? Absolutely. I just got very, very curious. And I originally intended to be a psychiatrist and that was the road I was going on. And then I became a bit disillusioned with psychiatry because um, psychiatrists, certainly back in the 80s when I qualified, were mainly kind of dishing out drugs and it didn't seem to be having a hugely beneficial effect. More recently, uh, we have discovered that actually what you eat has a pretty profound effect on things, particularly like depression. And there's a whole new field known as psychobiotics. And if I'd known about that stuff back in the 80s, that might have made a big difference. But no, I uh, got terribly interested in uh, new science, new ideas, and that uh, led me to joining the BBC. And um, I thought I'll go there for a couple of years and then go back into medicine, but that was a, that was a long time ago, so I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> I want to talk about uh, that career uh, in, in media as a, a health uh, science journalist, as a presenter. And I'm fascinated by your approach to uh, investigating health, which often involves testing the latest fads um, and doing things to yourself where you are essentially making yourself the guinea pig. Uh, this includes deliberately infecting yourself with a tapeworm in in the past. How does that rank on the list of weird and wonderful things you've done? Yeah, it was pretty high up. The genesis for it was actually a programme I made for Horizon back in the early 90s with a guy called Barry Marshall, who was um, a doctor in Australia. And he was convinced that stomach ulcers are caused not by stress, but by a previously unknown organism called Helicobacter pylori. So he brewed it up and he drank it himself. Uh, and then he induced gastritis and he basically took a handful of antibiotics and showed you could cure and at that time, uh, ulcers were regarded as an incurable disease. They, they could, you know, affected hundreds of millions of people. There was a drug you took called Zantac, and it was exactly like diabetes, the same story. So I loved the Barry story. Uh, when it came out, got a lot of very bad uh, press uh, in the medical press, but he won the Nobel Prize for Medicine five years afterwards, and he said my program had contributed to that. So that was a kind of driving force behind this interest in self-experimentation. And indeed... I was actually behind the camera at the time, and I wanted to do a series called The History of Medicine 
told through the stories of self-experimenters. And I pitched it to every controller of every channel for the next 15 years until I got in front of Janice Hadlow, who was controller of BBC4 at the time, and she said, well, you're obviously passionate about it, why don't you do it? And that's how I actually became a television presenter. And that led me, as you say, to doing weird and wonderful things. I always get my wife's approval uh, before. She's a GP. We met at medical school 40 years ago. I check it out. So when I did the tapeworm, uh, the deal was, yes, I would infect myself with a tapeworm to see what impact it had on my immune system. It was part of a series I was doing on parasites, but I would get rid of it before it came to full maturation because when that happens, basically, the segments break off, they crawl out of you, and they go seeking somebody else. So if we were sharing a bed, then there was a, at least a chance these tapeworm segments would go looking for Claire. Which oh, obviously gosh. She, was, she was lucky. Though. No, well, I have Very to ask, what, where does Claire draw the line? I was going to ask where you draw the line on what you will and won't do as a guinea pig, but I'd imagine it's your wife that's making and She makes some of the... Um, she was not keen on me getting infected with pubic lice. That was one of the other things they wanted to do. Uh, one of the assistant producers volunteered for that one, but Claire was not keen <laughs> on the pubic lice experiment, I have to say. <laughs> Is there a sense that um, you have obsessions of certain areas? It sounds as though, you know, in general, putting yourself through, well, weird and wonderful things uh, is something you really enjoy to do. I see your eyes light up as you're talking about it. What's your current obsession? Where's your focus health-wise at the moment? Uh, it is still very much with type 2 diabetes, with raised blood sugars, with raised blood pressure. It is still very, very much uh, with improving better ways of um, helping people lose weight and keep it off. What is... Th the science. Uh, my uh, wife Claire just published a book called The Fast 800 Keto Recipe Book and um, that's got the word keto in it and again asked me five years ago I would have said keto was a fad diet, it's nonsense. Actually it's been around for more than 100 years, originally developed to treat um, epilepsy, lots of interesting randomised controlled trials showing that it can be a very good way, certainly in the short term, uh, for weight loss and so um, I've embraced it in the same way I embraced intermittent fasting and other things. I go where the science goes, if you like. And that is, you know, there are ways of doing it healthily, ways of doing it badly. Uh, the recipe book is obviously, I would say, is healthy. And indeed, Claire did a randomised control trial with Oxford University using this approach and showed that um, average weight loss was nine and a half kilos in eight weeks. So it's got evidence behind it. Let's talk about yours. Just One Thing is the title, How Simple Changes Can Transform Your Life. And we're talking of really small things, like having a cold shower first thing in the morning, brushing your teeth while standing on one leg. How much of a difference can these things really make? I mean, I think they can make a substantial difference. Um, the book is based on a podcast series I do for the BBC, which is one of their highest rating podcasts. And the premise is very much, let's try this one thing. I do it, a member of the public does it, and then I talk to an expert about the benefits. So some of these things are harder to quantify than other things. But for example, standing on one leg uh, while brushing your teeth. The reason I do it that way is because I could go off and do yoga, but I'm not going to. Uh, I know the benefits there are three types of exercise you can do, and we know about them. There's aerobic exercise, running, walking, swimming. There's strength exercises, push-ups and squats. But then there is balance, and most people ignore the balance. And falling over is the second most common cause of accidental death worldwide after road traffic accidents. So a lot of people fall over because their balance ain't great. And there is some evidence that the coming, the younger generation, have worse balance than their elders because they spend so much time sitting down. So how do you improve your balance? You do it basically by uh, things like standing on one leg or doing yoga, whatever it might be. Now, when are you going to do it? Well, why not hook it to a habit you're already doing, which is brushing your teeth? You need to, you're advised to brush your teeth for two minutes a day. So I do 30 seconds one leg, 30 seconds the other leg, and so on. And, and I even was attempt pretty to do that, lousy to begin with. Yeah, I hear you even attempt to do that with eyes closed. Does that... Absolutely, that is better. much, much harder. There was actually a... If you can do... If you're over 40 and you can do more than 10 seconds, then you're doing well. Um, so ideally, you should be able to do at least 20 seconds with your eyes open. But when you close them, it's much, much more challenging. And indeed, there was a study done... Um, a few years ago where they looked at people in their 50s and they measured lots of things uh, and then they followed them 10 years later to see who was still alive and the best, the single best predictor of whether you would be healthy and still alive uh, was your ability to bounce on one leg when measured 10 years previously in your 50s. 
So that doesn't necessarily mean that if you improve it, your life will get longer. But what it does mean is balance is very, very important. How difficult is it, given that we're speaking as many are thinking of New Year's resolutions, perhaps two days in, managing to stick to them so far, but to, to take all of these good intentions and actually turn them into sustainable habits, how do you do that? OK, so the book contains 30 things. Um, and that was based on the first couple of series of just one thing. Uh, what I do is look through it, choose the things you think you can comfortably do, whether it is eating dark chocolate, going for early morning walks. And then ideally get your partner, if you have one, to do it with you. So one of the things I do every morning is I do what I call intelligent exercises. I roll out of bed and with Claire we do press-ups and squats. Now, neither of us like doing it, but we do it because the other one is urging them to do it. I also know there are huge benefits, not just for your body, but your brain. There's a wonderful study which showed that um, press up and squats, because they build muscles, but also because you're doing this vertical motion, that leads to big surges of blood to the brain. That in turn triggers the release of a hormone called BDNF in the brain. And that's like fertilizer for the brain. It's really good for the brain. So it's not just your muscles, but it's also good for your brain and for your mood. And so we do it first thing because the trigger is getting out of bed. I mm. talked about triggers before. So the trigger is getting out of bed. I could do them any time of day, but I won't. I know I won't do them. So Claire and I, we roll out of bed, and sometimes one says, you've got to do them. The other time, somebody else says, you've got to do them, but we do them. And we're gradually kind of building up. So uh, that's the best way is get somebody else. The only reason people have personal trainers is because uh, they come around, bang on your door and make you do it. Uh, we all know what we should do. But uh, so if you can't afford a personal trainer, then just do this. Find yourself a Claire who is going to motivate you to do it. Or to, yeah, you motivate her as well. It's not just, yeah. yeah. of course. Uh, you've talked about, um, uh, well, putting on a bit of weight mm. in, in recent years. And I wonder how much uh, of a sense you have that the pandemic has really forced us all to rethink our relationship with health, to rethink our own health and, and uh, health more widely of the communities uh, that we live in. What lasting impact has it had on, on your life? On my life, not so much. I have to say, um, that um, I got it COVID early, I'm triple vaxxed, I'm all those sort of things. These days, I'm primarily a writer, although I broadcast, most of that can be done remotely. So honestly, not a great deal, but I've seen it, you know, certainly in the statistics, and I've seen it in a lot of other people. Uh, a lot of people have really struggled, and that's not just with the fact that they're isolated, but also their mental health. Plus, there is unfortunately a great deal of evidence that kids have um, piled on the weight. And uh, I made a documentary a while ago called Who Made Britain Fat? And uh, I point the finger very firmly at ultra-processed food. Uh, but almost all the things which seemed to be going right with kids started going wrong immediately the pandemic happened. So particularly in the poorer communities, rates of obesity have soared. And this is going to have a terrible long-term impact because we know that if you're obese as a child, then you're likely to be obese as an adult. And although some people use um, this opportunity to do more exercise, most of us didn't. Most people became more sedentary, they ate more junk food, and they started to rely on those terrible apps, which, you know, can deliver food to your front door. So you don't even have to stagger to the takeaway. They will deliver it to you and they will um, keep hounding you. They will keep, once they have you, they will keep remorselessly pressing your triggers. Um, so the biggest growth over the last couple of years has been in takeaways delivered to front door, and that cannot be a good thing. Mm. We're seeing uh, the NHS in, in a crisis at the moment, thousands more paramedics, nurses and doctors preparing to walk out uh, in the coming month. How grave are your concerns about the state of healthcare in this country? Um, yeah, I'm very seriously worried because the stats in the immediate are terrible. And we also know there is a very, very clear line between um, obesity, overweight, and things like type 2 diabetes, which are incredibly expensive. You know, the NHS spends uh, something like 25 billion a year. Uh, it's calculated treating type 2 diabetes and also the, um, you know, the fact that people are no longer able to work and things like that. The costs are humongous. And the same thing is true of so many of these preventable diseases. And all the money seems to be going into hospital-based medicine, which obviously is great if you've broken your leg or you need cancer treatment. But at the same time, the money is being sucked away from social care and from GPs, which is where it is more cost-effective. The problem in the UK is we put a disproportionate amount of money 
into hospital care and not into these other areas which deliver much better long-term return. Well, fascinating then that so much of your focus really is on on self-help, on, on taking that and kind of a DIY approach to to, uh, to health and, and well-being. Um, where do people start with that? What's the best way if you're not someone that rolls out of bed and does <laughs> press up and squats to get going? I think, as I said, I would say read the book, just one thing, but why not? That's a good place to start. And just have a read through and see if it convinces you. There's a lot of science in there as well. Because I'm a firm believer if you're actually going to make a change, you want to know why you're making the change. I need to know what the science is rather than just being told this is what I should do. The examples are all incredibly specific. They give you very detailed instructions on how to do it because a lot of advice is generic. Uh, There was a study just before Christmas where they looked at GPs giving advice to patients about weight loss and most of it was generic, most of it was useless, a lot of it was actually wrong. And I'm not surprised because uh, doctors get almost no training in this. So I think you have to kind of immerse yourself in it. You have to be convinced that this is something that has benefit and then you need to give it a go and you need to stick to it for at least a couple of weeks. Mm. And as I said, uh, try and find somebody else to join you with it because we are social creatures and you are much, much more likely to stick to it if you do it with other people. I'd imagine this time of year is a particularly busy one for you, given your line of work. And so many of us are rethinking uh, our approach to to health and well-being at the start of a new year. What do you have in store for 2023? I'm doing, um, I've just done another podcast series of Just One Thing. So it's available now on BBC Sounds. Uh, The first app is all about how you can cut your sugar cravings by eating more fibre, and in particular a fibre called inulin. Um, So that was really interesting because I'm a sugarholic. Uh, I love sugary, you know, I find it, if they're in the house, I will eat them. Mm. Uh, So that um, series is available now on BBC Sounds. Uh, I've just done a series uh, called How to Live to 101, uh, which looks at the science of ageing. And in the course of that, I meet um, some of the world's great super agers. I travelled the planet last year uh, from China through Japan, US, looking at the science. And that was absolutely mind-bogglingly interesting so um that's one thing i'm doing and beyond that i'm about to embark on another series this time in australia on sleep so that'll keep me going a busy old year ahead just a final thought from you uh, the focus of, of self-help of, of doing uh, almost kind of hacks to, to, to transform your life is a real focus on social media and you see mm. uh tiktok trends for self-help and, and life hacks is that something you welcome do you think it's it's a good thing that more of us are talking about uh, this world it, the trouble with TikTok and things like that, some of it's great, some of it's terrible. In fact, I'd say 99% of it is terrible. So what you need to know is who's the person dispensing the advice and what is the science behind it? Is there any trial? Is there any evidence behind it? And on the whole, obviously, they're just dispensing uh, tips which sound faintly plausible and which are actually completely nonsense. So um, I think the danger with really short-term media is uh, you can be lured into doing things which are (laughs) likely to undermine your health rather than promote it. Mm. 